everyone. Thanks for coming today. You caught me relaxing in the break room where we do our class videos because we today have a broad fountain into the room and just the relaxing sound of water. Uh, I find just a really calming element. So maybe I'm a little lower key today, but I am excited to talk about water plants and water gardens. So let's get started. My name's Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 7Ds. And today we're talking about pond plants and easy water gardens. Now, um, I also just wanna touch on basic, um, like fountain care and maintenance while we're on the subject. Um, but this is really just kind of a fun discussion of how to, how to introduce a new, perhaps, element to your garden, which is just the element of water. <clears throat> it's all up to you, honestly, on, on you know what scale you wanna take this, whether you want a full uh, running, you know, natural looking stream with boulders and uh, a pond that, you know, is surrounded by permanent plantings that, you know, really is a, 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 you know, endeavor in the landscape, takes a lot of planning and some professional installation. But you can also have running water from the simple addition of the smallest of fountains, for example. Um, here I got in one that I could just easily lift and carry in my own arms. And this is just a little concrete, um, gosh, maybe a foot long by six inches wide tabletop fountain, for example, or this could be tucked into the corner of a narrow space, even like a, a balcony um, to just, can you hear it? I hope you can hear it on camera. Maybe if I get closer, there we go. <clears throat> just a nice calming sound of water. Um, hopefully, now for some people, it makes you have to go to the bathroom. And if that's the case, um, then water gardens without pumps might be a better uh, solution for you, but we'll talk about all those options. It's, um, it's really just very simple. It's, you can use almost whatever vessel you have or want to um, showcase water plants. It depends again on the size of the vessel as to what plants you're really gonna be able to, to keep or showcase. Um, and then whether you have the moving water, uh, which can help to keep the water clear and um, you know free of insect larva or that kind of thing, or still water, things like water lilies prefer to have calm or still water without the movement of a pump. <clears throat> the just enhancement that water brings to your garden, everything from you know the reflection of light on the water surface, um, an added attraction to damselflies, dragonflies, um, butterflies, more insects. My friend Karen uh, has a small pond in her yard and finds that in the driest times of summer, um, honeybees from like the surrounding neighborhood all line up on the edge of her cement fountain and or pond and sip the water. And I guess they're called tanker bees. Um, so they like drink up a whole bunch of water and bring it back to the hive and, and provide water to their hive. So, you know, having a source of water in your garden creates an additional element of habitat, if that's something that you are focused on. Um, but it also just, again, enhances your senses, sound, light, movement, um, and then the plants that you can add to your water garden is just a whole nother range of gardening that maybe you didn't have access to previous um, to adding you know a water bowl or a tub now um, here on my table i have uh, everything from the most kind of basic galvanized tub uh, i you know honestly i crossed my fingers and just held my breath when i filled this tub full of water because i really hoped that it was watertight um, so that obviously is something you have to make sure of. If your um, container isn't watertight, but it's close, you can seal the seams with something like an aquarium sealant. Um, if you intend to put plants or fish in the tub, 
do make sure that the sealant or whatever material you use is pet, or excuse me, plant and fish safe or aquatic safe. But uh, everything from a basic galvanized tub to, um, you know, like I said, fountains, a larger fountain can actually contain pond plants in the movement of the fountain. I have a lotus here that we will talk about. Lotus and water lilies are best in larger tubs. <clears throat> and then I have some floating aquatic plants that I have brought in and put into some just fun decorative glass containers, mostly because I think they're so interesting to look at. And depending on your glass vessel, you can really, um, I mean, the features, for example, are enhanced, almost magnified in the glass. So this is a perfect example of kind of the magnification done in glass to the root system of this aquatic floating water hyacinth. So we can see the top of the water hyacinth. And this is such a simple plant. This is all it needs to live. Although honestly, it's going to reproduce and run out of space in a small bowl like this. So you would neither need to um, like split off the divisions and then put them elsewhere. Um, but it, you know, this was gonna be a wet class. So I've got a rag nearby. The water hyacinth is a simple floating plant. Its roots get uh, nutrients from the water that it grows in. It does provide some oxygen and as it reproduces, which it does by sending out this little stem. So the main clump here has sent out a little stem and the little stem is now growing an additional group of plants that's going to get bigger and become another kind of rosette and it'll continue to multiply off in that form so that you could once this plant's a little bit bigger and has some roots you could separate it from the main plant by that cutting that stem and then you would have two clumps of water hyacinths now this uh, plant as i mentioned as it multiplies will cover the surface of your um, water bowl or of your pond, for example, which can help if you have fish and things that can help to protect, protect them from predators, but it also helps to cool your water so that you don't have direct sunlight heating up the water, which then causes algae and some other kind of, um, oh, dirty, you know, pond situations. <clears throat> so having it outside in a water bowl or in a um, pond, it can end up, end up benefiting the water itself, but having it simply in a pretty vase or a glass vessel like this, again, I like to just enjoy it. <clears throat> it's beauty. It's really um, nice to just kind of see the whole plant, including that intricate and delicate root system. Now, hyacinth do best in at least partial sun to full sun, but they don't need direct, so bright light at least four hours. If you have it inside your home, about the same. So at least, you know, four hours of indirect bright light, or you could provide it with a little fluorescent grow light. When they are outdoors or enough light indoors, they will produce a small purple flower. I don't think it's re reminiscent of a hyacinth, but um, maybe that's why it got its name is that some people think it looks like a hyacinth. So the bloom on it, is a good couple of inches, um, pale purple, it's a pretty flower. So you get that added bloom on this little floating plant going around in the pond. Now I have used water hyacinth before in um, my fountain outdoors. And what I found um, much to my dismay is that they kept disappearing. So I would put them out in my pond or in my fountain. Uh, they'd float around for a day or two. And then um, one day I'd notice that they were gone. After some further investigation, I discovered that um, I was finding eaten up chunks of the water hyacinth um, kind of stashed underneath my porch and, and in other areas of the garden um, and determined that it was being eaten and, and stolen basically um, and eaten by raccoons who do like to come and visit my fountain. Um, so if you do have raccoons that come to your garden, possibly water hyacinths are not your best bet. Um, you might, if you don't know, try one or two before you invest in, you know, a dozen for your pond. 
and just see that they stick around um, longer than you know a couple days. Um, but if that is a problem for you and you do find that raccoons are eating your water hyacinths, you may try water lettuce. Now, um, water lettuce, although it does look a lot like lettuce, is not an edible. Um, so don't confuse that for, um, you know, a little head of uh, butter crunch, thing like that. But water lettuce, again, has this similar, wonderful, intricate, feathery root system. I do think water hyacinth's roots are a little bit prettier, but I mean, that's kind of splitting hairs. They're sort of violet, violet, um, purple in color, where this is just kind of feathery white. Um, but again, super cool. And when you put them in a, um, you know, vase of water, they do get kind of magnified and really just um, interesting to look at. Another little floater, uh, water lettuce is not a bloomer, so it's not really going to flower for you, which means that you could put it in mm, four-ish hours of sun and still have a nice plant that performs well because um, you're not relying on or asking for it to bloom. This little uh, example here has a shorter existing root system, but at the moment it's already producing two little offsets. So this is how the same as the water hyacinth, water lettuce reproduces by making this little umbilical cord and then creating an offset of a plant that has then grown its own root system. And if we wanted to, we could snip, we'll do this cause it'll be cute. We'll snip this plant from the parent got a nice root system of its own. We'll put the mom and the other guy back there. And then we can add this little water lettuce to this group of floaters. And now that just gives us a little extra something something in this tabletop water garden that we'll um, talk about here in just a minute. So this is how you can kind of propagate or share or help spread the water plants that you have as they grow. And even, so we consider these floaters to be annuals. It means they're not gonna survive the winter. Your pond, um, your water feature, you know, whatever it is, it's likely to freeze if you keep it running. Um, if not, you're gonna drain it. And again, we'll talk more about that when we discuss more maintenance. But honestly, this is not, um, these plants are not gonna survive year round in the, in the Pacific Northwest or in the Portland metro area. However, freakish weather conditions as we have been known to have um, globally now, you never know. Um, some of these plants, these aquatic species have become invasive species, maybe not in our region yet, uh, but in lots of other waterways across the country and throughout the world. So um, water hyacinth, as I just showed you what a cute little plant it is. Um, it's not even allowed to be sold in the state of Florida. I'm pretty sure, maybe I've got un outdated information, but pretty sure it's not available to be sold in Florida because it gets out into the waterways. And then that nice warm water that it has there, um, any freshwater channels or canals that just reproduces and out competes native flora, which probably also doesn't provide any food supply for, you know, like manatees and the other critters that are hanging out there. So we don't want water hyacinths choking up the Everglades, just like we don't want any of the other, you know, frog bit or water lettuce or the azola, the water fern, um, to get out into our local waterways. So here I am in Lake Oswego, our own uh, lake here in the town of Lake Oswego has struggled on its own with algae blooms, for example, and other um, water quality issues. So it, it's, it's critical, and I do mention this in the handout, which again, the handout, there's a handout attached to this um, video. It's right underneath the title or description of the video. It's a link. If you cannot access the link, please make a comment and we'll be sure to um, directly link it to you. The handout stresses but if you end up being over successful with your water plants, if your plants reproduce crazy big time and you've got more than you can support in your pond, um, please do not throw them out into uh, just the waterways or um, dispose of them properly. So they make great compost. If you wanna compost them, share them with friends um, who again will also treat them responsibly. Um, and I know that you will do that. 
So above, above ground or even in ground ponds are going to have a couple of different um, zones essentially. So let's say you have like a full on uh, waterfall with a big collection pool at the base of the waterfall that the water all runs into and then the pump sits at the bottom of that which recirculates the water back up to the waterfall and down. So you have this lovely closed system, a nice running uh, natural waterfall and, and stream. The plants that you can have in that system would include marginal or perimeter plants. So plants that can grow in maybe a splash zone where the water is often wet but not constantly soaked or underwater. It's an area that uh, maybe if you topped it all the way off for a really heavy rainfall, uh, the, the level of water might go an inch over your plant's roots or not even to the plant's roots. So that would be kind of a, a perimeter or, or marginal area where <clears throat> buffering kind of layer plants help to hide and, and kind of make that transition in your landscape from the edging of the actual structure that you have, whether it's rocks and boulders or a pond liner or a cement basin, whatever it is that you have, something that's planted in there that enhances and kind of helps to make that transition. So that may include, um, here is a, a gorgeous iris. Um, this, is a, this is actually a Louisiana iris um, and it's just getting ready to flower, but it has this like purple black bloom and these wonderful water irises um, here in the northwest we tend to see mostly the yellow flag water iris um, blooming out in our waterways and in some of the wetlands that we have um, but it's that same nice stiff architectural foliage uh, very sturdy and um, then again you get this elegant bloom usually just once a season so um, kind of early summer and then that foliage stays through uh, you know till winter similar looking in the kind of blade like or grassy foliage i did not bring any in but cattails cattails make a great margin or edging plant they can get wet they can stay dry um, they give you that wonderful you know remember cattails right they give you that wonderful cattail there's miniature versions that don't get quite as tall as um, the great big ones but they can get up to four or five feet with their um, little hot dog on a stick looking cattail blooms that they make. So cattails are another wonderful margin plant. Um, cannas are another great one. So here I have this <clears throat> absolutely gorgeous canna. This is Napoleon and Napoleon is one of the lovely kind of water cannas. It's got its um, first little flower out for the season so it's going to bloom for a pretty long time but also that bold foliage that gives us a real tropical feel which i think is fun around fountains um, this is one that we can have in shallow water but we don't want it to be like totally at the bottom of the pond for example so if this were in a pond you would have it raised up so that it's got um you know maybe a brick or a couple of boulders underneath it so that it's sitting up higher in the water level and at the most, maybe an inch or so over the crown of the pot of the plant, and that water level could uh, vacillate so that it's not constantly soaked like that. Or it could be out of the pond on the edge, where again, maybe it gets splashed from the stream or the, um, yeah, from the you know waterfall or stream, but it's just in regular soil, uh, that's fine for a canna as well. <clears throat> in the annuals which there are other there are great annuals that are a lot of fun around the water pe water features and ponds um not only because you don't commit to a you know permanent planting but annuals grow fast in most cases so you get this real satisfying feel of something kind of rapidly growing and also in many cases an annual has a uh, less uh, extensive and in, mo in many instances less invasive root system. So in a single season its roots aren't going to get so big that it might puncture or uh, begin to 
um, you know, encroach on some of the liner or the edging or, you know, the mechanics of your water feature structure. So we, we do have to be careful of that kind of thing. Planting a willow at the edge of a water feature, sure, willows love water, but they love water so much that the willow roots may actually like go toward and possibly even um, into like a, a permeable liner and then pierce your liner, which then gives you a leak, which gives the willow everything it wants because now it, all the water is going down to the willow, but then your pond is no longer functional. So um, being smart about what you plant around uh, the margin of your, of your pond or water feature and considering what the root system will or may do is just another factor. So annual wise, I have talked about red bananas before, but I mean, when you come and see them at the garden center, you'll be talking about them too. They're glorious, they're fabulous, they are dramatic, and um, they're just here for a single season. We love them for uh, the flair that they give in gardens, whether it's that like Pacific North, they look great with Japanese maples and kind of the Northwest fusion landscape. Or you could pull them off with, well, I have here my lovely windmill palm. I have borrowed a bird of paradise from the indoor department just because, again, I love those big glossy leaves and this tropical feel of the red banana, all making that lush, um, I don't know, the feel that goes along with my little trickling water and helps me relax, especially foliage always helps me relax. Flowers sometimes make me nervous. Um, or just a little bit more anxious. They require either my attention um, or, you know, they should be appreciated because they're not, they're, they're here and gone. So you have to do more with flowers. I don't know, maybe that's just because I work with them. I'm constantly surrounded in flowers. Oh, the worries that I have. <clears throat> but so again, starting small, or jumping straight in, uh, whatever it is that you choose to do, um, water features and semi-aquatic plants and aquatic plants are just a really fun, um, they're a fun element of gardening. And in so many cases, I mean, like by the time midsummer comes around, I mean, this year it hasn't been a problem because it won't stop raining. But like last year it was so hot from the very beginning, it was hot and then we had our heat and blah, blah, blah. And by summer... Like I was tired of watering all my plants that needed water. The plants that can just sit in a tub of water, amen to that. I'm done. I'm sitting back on my bistro table, appreciating the plants on their own. Um, as long as I just make sure that their little saucers are full or the water level has been topped off. So there's something magically wonderful about the ease of aquatic plants in that sense that it's not a constant fight to keep them hydrated. Um, as I mentioned annuals and the banana and I get all carried away when I talk about the banana, another really cool annual that can um, again either be a semi-submerged aquatic plant or not aquatic at all, um, even in a pot or a container near your pond or by your fountain just to add to the kind of whimsy and tropical effect. This is papyrus. Um, this is the dwarf papyrus. It's called Prince Tut. Prince Tut gets a foot and a half to almost three feet tall with these little uh, pom-pom, kind of green pom-poms that'll get a little bit bigger. Just has this kind of graceful look and feel to it. But like overboard dr drama comes from King Tut. So this is papyrus King Tut and his pom-poms get like as big as my head. So these little green pom-poms are gonna get much bigger as the plant gets taller. In fact, it can get 45 to 72 inches tall. So um, as tall as me or more. And um, for us in the Northwest, it is considered an annual, let's see, it's hardy to, Oh, it's hardy to 30 degrees, so it's not likely that we'd get it to survive. If you try to bring it in the house and overwinter it, um, gets pretty thick stems by the end of the season, and it's a great, like, good, good sized plant. Um, at the um, Lake Oswego location, and I think maybe even using it in a couple of other containers, um, like our roadside and parking lot kind of display containers at some of our other stores. So. As the summer goes on, you will notice 
these, um, now that we have summer and some warmth, these plants just kind of explode in um, volume and then they're kind of um, little green, I don't know, shaggy fringe. It's just whimsical and fun. So annuals though, as I mentioned, unless you do something about it, bring them in. Same with the floating plants, you can also bring them in. So uh, treat the, as I mentioned, water lettuce, water hyacinth, and, and the frog bed I'll talk about. We treat these all as annuals. At the end of the season, you're gonna compost them um, and, and just toss them like you would a petunia. Um, thanks for a great season. You know, I'll buy you again next year because one of these is like um, $3.50 or something like that. So it's not, a, it's, it's not a huge investment. And if you take care of one, you will watch it multiply and give you plenty more. So even again, depending on the, the size and your patients, um, they will multiply themselves to give you more plants over time. Perennial wise, uh, the iris is a great perennial. The canna um, is a tender perennial. So depending on the season and the drainage for it over winter, um, we do sometimes dig up our cannas and store them out of the ground over winter, but even that's not a sure thing. So you just, I roll the dice on canna. I think it's worth just putting them out there and if they come back they come back and if they don't um i try it again usually <laughs> um now i have here also on my table a water lotus uh, so this is actually uh close to blooming uh this has two flower buds on it but they're not very big yet because this lotus um, is growing in a pot its roots are constricted it's got um, the ability to get larger and larger over time. This is a dwarf variety nonetheless. So it's a dwarf pink called Holy Fire. And uh, so a dwarf lotus is going to have smaller leaves, smaller flowers, and probably even be a little bit shorter. But the cool thing about a lotus, oh, I'll lift it up, you can kind of see. So it is in a pot, it's growing in a container that has a special, like an aquatic soil mix that's kind of heavy so it doesn't you know float and make muck all the time so it's in this aquatic soil in a pot with no holes and then when you buy it you're going to put it into your pond or your water tub and you can either drop it straight down to the bottom it can go as deep as like three feet my understanding three feet deep so down to the bottom of a three foot pond and with the light that comes through the water of your pond, these um, stems will grow longer and the leaves will eventually get taller and taller so that the leaf itself is right on the water surface and floating at the level that you have given it to grow to. So um, if you want, you can also give it a slower transition like build up a couple of bricks so that it's just barely underwater. Let those leaves come to the surface as they slowly grow, drop a brick down again, lower, let the leaves grow up and step, stair step it down. Um, if you don't want to have the dramatic sunken lotus effect. Um, but again, over time they will, they will reach the surface. Same with the water lily, um, although again, depending on your water lily, the depth that the lily prefers is usually on the tag or you'll find the information about a uh, hardy water lily. Where water lotus are typically protected in the winter, so either um, stored in a greenhouse or um, brought in to a garage and given a grow light even. I mean, you could just keep water in this tub. As you see, there's water in my tub here so if you could keep water in there, keep it lit, keep it from freezing over the winter, um, just bringing it out of the elements would be enough to help it survive the winter. But leaving it in our ponds is usually not an option when it comes to a water. Hardy lilies, water lilies on the other hand, usually be down to the furthest, deepest point in your pond, as long as it's uh, you know not just a little bucket. So you want to put it down deeper in a pond where it doesn't freeze and then just leave it undisturbed in the winter. Um, usually they're going to die back just like they would out in nature. Um, so the pond 
can help insulate it in that case and the root ball just sits down in that soil bucket on the bottom of the pond for um, the winter and then emerges or breaks dormancy in spring as things warm up. Now, um, if you're planting, I mean, you can also plant directly into your pond um, using, as I mentioned, a very special aquatic soil mixture. But the more um, movement and disruption, you know, a big stream coming down, a lot of water moving down is likely to disturb and churn uh, that soil. So it may take, it may take a long time for um, a pond to settle, for the water to settle. Um, if you're introducing the soil and the aquatic soils and potted plants into the actual water system itself. Floaters on the other hand tend to be clean, um, but I notice right away on, you know, the few water lettuce, water hyacinth that I put into this bucket, somehow hitchhiking along on the ride was some duckweed. And if you look closely at duckweed, um, it's no wonder that it just comes along on some plant or on a duck's leg if they move from waterway to waterway. Here is, here's a close up of a little clump of duckweed. It's also like a water fern, basically. Uh, Azola, as I mentioned, it's got a tiny root system. We can see just a little root system here. This is a clump that I can pull apart and get individual little pieces. One little piece will multiply again to become many. And if you don't, so this small of an aquatic floater can get caught up into the pump mechanism if you're running a pump on your water feature. This can cause a problem and cause you to have to clean your fountain pump more frequently. If you are concerned about Azola in your pond and you want to make sure that you don't have any, you can take, it's stuck to my fingers even, <coughs> you can water <coughs> plants that are not them, uh, like your water lettuce here, when you purchase it from the garden center, take it home and rinse it really well to make sure that there are no hitchhikers. Um, it, there may be even just, you know, our shoppers, if it's not us, are going to mix the scoops and end up getting a little bit of one plant in another bucket. So you may have some just floating around. I see some, some got into the water here. So like I said, if you want to avoid that, just rinse them off before you introduce them to um, an actual pond uh, pump circulation system. <clears throat> it is uh, also, if you... If you have a still water garden, if your um, you know landscape or what do they call them? Not landscape, uh, livestock trough. Those are great water features as well. I mean that's what they were meant for, right? You have a livestock trough that you've maybe given up on veggie gardening or moved on to sow a bigger plot, and now you can fill that with water and have a really cool water garden. If it's still and non-recirculating, you may end up with a mosquito larva issue. So, I mean, that's standing water, uh, especially if there's open water. So, I mean, I, I think better coverage would probably reduce the mosquito larva. But no matter what, standing water is uh, just a magnet for mosquito to lay their eggs. and You'll end up with um, a problem down the line. So we uh, do have a couple of mosquito control products. This I use in my fountain and bird bath. This um, is safe for birds and aquatics. It's mosquito bits, which really contains a bacteria basically that kills the larva of mosquitoes in the water. Um, we also happen to use it uh, in house plants. And if you're a house plant lover, and you've been dealing with fungus gnats, uh, this is a product that we use to treat fungus gnats in indoor plants as well as mosquito and mosquito larvae in our outdoor um, places where there might be standing water. And if you think like your neighbor um, maybe has, I don't know, old tires on the other side of the fence, and you're constantly swatting yourself uh, from mosquitoes, especially on such a wet spring as we've had, I take some of this and I do toss it over my fence just kind of at the perimeter where I think that there's some standing water that I'm pretty sure the mosquitoes are coming from. So um, 
safe and, and effective product if that is your next question is, yeah, well, what about mosquitoes? <coughs> Excuse me. I have, um, in addition to the water, water hyacinth, we've talked now about the azola. I've got this really sweet, it looks almost like uh, little water lilies, um, but it's another floater. This is like uh, little lily pads, right? We would just have a frog sitting on this. Uh, it would be a tiny frog, but speaking of the name, it is frog bit. Um, so frog bit is another floater. Do you see kind of a lot of root for such a little plant, but frog bit makes the same satellite effect. So you see that little stem there with the start of another little plantlet. So that's gonna be a baby frog bit that we'll be able to separate as the plant grows. It is um, flat on the top and makes this nice little rosette, but on the undersides, it has this really cool like bladder. And the bladders that come up, can you see that? Yeah, so the bladder and even from, let's see, let's look at it upside down. So the bladder is like puffy and full of air. So these cells are full of air. And that's what makes the whole plant float on the leaf surface. The water hyacinths have the same thing. And I think that's what the raccoons must like. Um, maybe it's like potato chips for them. They must be crunchy. Um, so this may be another one. That, I've never tried frog bit in my pond. Might be another one that gets eaten up by the coons. Um, just keep your eyes out because... Those little banditos are aggressive and it's trouble enough to have them in your, you know, if they come and disturb your water feature, you don't want to be bringing them in for another whole reason, like um, something that they like to snack on. But frog bit is fun. Um, and as I mentioned, let's see, that's one. Here's one. Here's two little plants. This one's already giving us multiple offshoots this guy's already got some roots so we could even separate that off if we wanted i mean these you know you could go really tiny and just have it in a like a fish bowl or something um but just remember over time you'll either trim or prune or separate as they propagate because you'll run out of space in your little fish bowl so here my example i'm gonna spill i drop something i break something this is like a six inch fish bowl and here we put in our Two little plants. I almost have to go one at a time. It's cool. They totally write themselves. You don't have to like put them right. Just get their roots underwater. Get in there. And then they just sort of, you know, work around each other, find space. This one is not deep enough. So their roots are coiled at the bottom. That's fine. They don't seem to mind. We could even trim those roots a little bit if we wanted, but I could add a little more water, a pretty little stone in there if I wanted. In fact, I don't know if you can see the bottom on this one as I, yeah, you can see the cool little rocks that are down in the bottom too. So you could put in your favorite little gemstones, um, you know, a little, one of those like message rocks, you know, like breathe or whatever, you know, um, that would be funny underwater, right? Um, what, you know what I mean, right? Hope and love and all of those message rocks. You could put a message rock down there. That's fun. Um, so the floaters, and the, another one. I forget what this one's called. I'll put it in the notes. This is another, look at the red, reddish orange roots on this one. Um, I do have a, there's the baby water lettuce. Take this guy out for a minute. Cool red stringy roots. Um, some random stones and a uh, fool's gold in there. Uh, maybe red spine plant or something like that red backbone again i'll remember the name and put it in the comments you can see some of the red color coming out on the leaves they grow in kind of this little stringy uh i don't know viney almost linear fashion um they must just float because they've got kind of a cupped leaf which probably traps a little bit of air between the water and the leaf i don't know how these guys float they don't have a bladder like the others uh and again just drop them in there, shake it around a little bit. They're perfect. I've planted a perfect water garden. So, you know, it's hot out. Maybe you don't want to, it's getting hot out. Maybe you don't want to garden too much. This is just my style sometimes. Um, just fun, fun, fun little floaters. 
oh, put this guy back in there. They're not like goldfish either. I mean, you can pick them up at the garden center, keep them out of water for an hour, just not like dry it out. And, you know, you could even wrap them up in a napkin and take them home. We give you a plastic bag or a, you know, plastic container to take them home in, but you don't have to like rush home or worry about um, feeding them or anything like that. No, you can, you can feed them. Um, and occasionally you'll see like your water temperature gets too hot. The plants kind of start to yellow and you get maybe an algae or a slime uh, collection in the water. It's time to change the water. It's uh, always, you know, uh, evaporation, depending on like if you get splash from your fountain, you're going to have some water evaporate then or just plain sun does evaporate water slowly out of water features and standing uh, tubs of water. You have to top it off every so often with water. If you do top it off, consider um, either putting uh, the water into like a, a um, watering can and then slowly pouring the can into the water feature rather than like blasting it with the hose. The more you blast it, the more air bubbles you may throw in and either disturb the soil that you've worked so hard to get to settle or sometimes adding too much air um, and oxygenating the water can again just kind of create an imbalance where um, maybe you get an algae bloom or, or other kind of um, unintended consequences, let's just say that. <clears throat> now, other semi-aquatics and marginal plants, depending on our garden centers, you will see a range, um, as I mentioned, the cattails, pickerel weed, um, we have water clover, which can be mostly submerged, uh, juncus, so the rushes, some are more um, like equisetum, always be careful with equisetum, it's uh, the cat or the um, horsetail rush, become horribly invasive if you let it go, but great in a container um, and, and kind of a fun structural architectural form. But again, all of these things uh, you'll see at your local garden center and kind of the, I don't know, it's best to just see them and envision. If you're doing a water feature or a smaller tub, you may only have maybe three, maybe five plants total in the whole tub. So you want to choose Oh, texture um, and, you know, at different elements that all enhance and kind of go along with one another and look, look pleasing together. You um, will see towards the end of the handout kind of general maintenance. Most, I mean, my fountain I have had, it's a concrete or cement fountain. It's at least, it's more than an inch thick. You know, it's a big, thick, heavy duty bowl. It has sat outside unprotected um, year round in my garden for 10 years or more. The fountain itself, oh, um, it's had a, um, like a glaze on it, um, a stain, like a concrete stain. And that's sort of worn over time. So that's the only wear and tear that I've seen on the actual fountain itself. But inside the fountain, there is a mechanical unit that is the fountain pump. And the fountain pump is the one and only thing that is likely to wear out in your entire like water feature or fountain over the long, you know, many, many years that you have it. Um, in some bigger in water garden and water feature instances, you also may have a separate filter or filter box. And that's another piece of maintenance that I'm not gonna go into because it's kind of extensive, but maintaining a fountain pump and occasionally replacing a fountain you may do more than once in 15 years as i have now a couple of times i blame those raccoons because um for whatever reason the raccoons have wanted to take the pump from out take the pump out of my fountain so if they can get access to the pump um, my raccoons have found that it's a great game to disconnect it from the tubing that uh, comes out of the top of the pump and pull the pump out of the fountain itself. And because at various times it runs on a timer, which is what's the smartest so that it turns off at night, but sometimes it's not on a timer. Um, I don't know why, but 
when it's still running at night and the damn raccoons pull it out of the fountain, the fountain pump sits there and pumps dry air. So when it pumps dry and is not in water, the motor burns out. And that kills the fountain pump to the point where I, I don't think it's, it's repairable. In fact, I've, I've just, that's when I replace them. So um, if that happens, and there is, in my fountain, there is this little, like, sneaky trap door of, like, a, a little panel that I can pull off, push the pump inside where it connects to the tubing, and kind of close this little cement door. Um, but the raccoons have figured out how to, so I have to bar the door shut and everything. So in many cases, the pumps are hidden or um, disguised or at least in... Um, you know, kind of a lower, but well, they have to be in a lower portion usually of the fountain. Um, but this pump I took from uh, one of our fountains that we have on display here at the garden center. This is um, 170 to 320 gallon per hour pump. And that's, um, I mean, that's a lot, right? 170 to 320 gallons per hour. The pump that this ran or the fountain that this ran was like a two tier, but not ginormous. Um, this is about the size of the pump that I have at home and sometimes it's not so much gallons per hour as its height that the pump is able to pump water to. So if this was sitting at the basin of then a pillar that's maybe three feet tall and another basin at the top, a tubing connects the, the pump to where the water has to come out. If that's a two foot or a three foot distance from your pump's source, you need to make sure that the pump is strong enough to push that water that high. So um, you'll see that again, usually on uh, the, the box or the material, the information on your pump. Um, or if you have bought one, bought a fountain or something that comes with the pump, um, in, in most cases, it's the right pump for the fountain. So you can trust on that. And then just take that pump in when you need to replace it um, to the place that you, you know, go to buy your pumps. This guy has, um, I show this because when it's time to clean the pump, uh, you need to remove it from the fountain and um, unplug it, obviously. And then it's just good to kind of know a little bit about the pump and how it works. This is a long cord. Um, it has the um, three prong, you know, so it's a grounding cord, which is great for outdoor use. But again, you could use this inside if you wanted. The top where the um, water actually comes out of, so when we plug this in, water comes out of the top here. The intake is from this front, uh, the grid that you see. And most pumps have little suction cup feet on the bottom, so, uh, or they're like in the box. Um, so the little suction cup feet, of course, are meant to suction down onto the bottom of your fountain so that the pump stays in one spot. Um, but that's not gonna stop a raccoon from grabbing it if they want it, um, believe me. Then, in most cases, depending on, come on, what tubing, if you are attaching tubing to the top to run it up to another part of your fountain, you're gonna have some different attachment pieces that can either you know, go on to, oh, lost it in the Lotus, uh, attachment pieces that can go on to make adapting uh, sizes for various tubes. Um, so we've got the bigger, and then this guy would be the smaller um, to put your tubing into. Sometimes it's just perfect what you've got right there. <clears throat> and then here we see on the very front of the pump, at the very front we have this dial and you'll see, um, I'm not sure which direction it is, but on one side you see a plus, and on one side you see a minus. And the dial turns to adjust the flow, the rate of flow on the pump itself. So if it's supposed to pump three feet and you have it down to the lowest of the minus, it may only pump, you know, two feet. So turning the fountain pump all the way up or adjusting it will also help to kind of monitor the splash and the degree of water that comes out. The top uh, intake portion of the pump usually also is removable. We have on this one, we have these little like finger grooves or whatever to grab it and pull it off. 
So I take the top, the just the top cover off, and then we are exposed to the whole motor of the the pump itself. So sometimes you've got to just like dump this, flush it, uh, f you know, flush it in water. I will occasionally blow right into it, which blows any kind of like, yeah, usually it's totally gross water, and I'm doing not oh gross. Um, you're gonna blow out whatever like weird little bits of like algae or maybe like a. Um, I don't know, a little piece of weed seed or something gets stuck in there. This part often, the front grid is maybe just going to get kind of slimy or mucky. Um, different times of year, fall, you know, fall, everything's like the leaves are falling, the wind blows. And for me, there's a Douglas fir in my neighbor's yard. Then all of the little pollen cones, which are just tiny little things, all the little pollen cones end up in my fountain. So um, if I'm not on top of keeping it clean with a skimmer, then those little cones kind of sink down to the bottom and then they get sucked up slowly into this grid, which slows the intake of my water, which slows the trickle of the fountain down, sometimes even overburdening the motor itself. So that can help kind of wear out your motor. Unplug pull this off or just, you know, clean the cover, clean your pump itself, make sure that it's back in um, working order. So to put it back, we have a little, you know, everything fits kind of the way that it should. Never like force it, but uh, sometimes they click back together. This one just feels nice and secure. Then I can go ahead and plug it back in, uh, run my tubing, and I've got a nice, clean, maintained fountain. That might have to be done. Um, once a month that might have to be done every um, season you know it depends on what overhangs your fountain what um, you know do you have water plants in there the more water plants you have the more you may need to keep that filter clean just because of debris some of us have pets that love to drink our fountain water so if you've got a dog that you know will come by and slurp up like a half gallon of water in one pass then you'll need to, again, make sure that you are topping it off on a regular basis so that the water level doesn't go so low that the pump starts to strain or pump dry. And then you'll also want to take note of the plants that you're using in your fountain and make sure, of course, that, you know, if the pet accidentally slurped up a little piece of it, um, that they are pet safe as well. So those, again, just things to take into consideration um, when you think about everybody that's going to enjoy and use the the water feature in your garden children absolutely love fountains um, at the garden center it is one thing that little hands and feet off and run straight to um, and of course they want to put their hands right in to the water feature so it's just a great way to also kind of you know enhance your garden for um, youngsters that may not be able to do everything that you can do in the garden but they can um, help top off the water feature and you know put in a couple of floating plants and, and help to care for them as well last uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic plant that i'll mention and um, really that this is just because i love them so much um, Carnivor we have some carnivorous plants that are in our pond uh, area or water plant area today and the the two plants that we have are Saracenias or types of um, hardy pitcher plants and the hardy pitcher plants aren't exactly uh, plants that would grow I mean they can grow in a pond but they don't want to be over their soil line with water so they would be best um, I've seen some really cool ones done where they're actually in like a floating I mean it's kind of um, lame to have a floating hunk of styrofoam and maybe they make things that are really more like for ponds um, but like a planter that was sitting in a stung a chunk of high styrofoam so that the whole thing just floated around on the pond surface and was um, growing these awesome uh, saracenias or pitcher plants. This is uh, Saracenia purpurea venosa. This is just a, um, a cool variety that has these neat kind of limey or chartreuse colored pitchers that come out. Um, they eat flies, 
uh, they eat anything that can fit in their mouths, basically. So flies, yellow jackets, mosquitoes, gnats. Um, they can eat honeybees and pollinators and other bees. So friendlies, not so friendlies. They don't know the difference. Uh, but pitcher plants, um, here is, so that's one variety. It was easy to carry. This guy's a little bit heavier, um, but oh my gosh, so pretty. So this is uh, cat, uh, cat's bee eye. Um, again, hardy to zone seven. Going to eat whatever fits in its mouth. Probably get a little bit taller, but this variety um, tends to be a little bit shorter with its hoods, not as um, vertical. Gorgeous purple color, which holds through most of the season. And in these little in these little deadly mouths, um, they kind of smell attractive to flies. Flies go, go in and then they fall down into the basin um, and there's like a digestive fluid that the plant creates to break down the insect and it um, acts like fertilizer for the plant. So yes, they photosynthesize. They're still able to um, convert energy from the sun's light to um, give them their basic growing needs, but then they like amplify all of that with the ability to catch bugs as they fly by. Um, perfect in containers that maybe don't have drain holes in the bottom so that they hold some water, but they're not going to fill up completely with water. My um, carnivorous plants at home are in pots that have holes, but then in the um, underneath the pot, I've given them all deep saucers that water stands in so that they never dry out. So they can pull water up from the bottom um, in that kind of wet, boggy condition. <clears throat> there is also a special soil mix similar to the aquatic plants that goes um, best for carnivorous plants. Um, and if you have interest in growing carnivorous plants, uh, because I love them so much, uh, and if I'm ever here, I'd love to talk to you about them at the Lake Oswego store. Many fans uh, of carnivorous plants at our other garden centers as well. And we do have a care sheet um, that we send you home with as a nice email um, attachment if you're in our plant loyalty program so that you can learn how to grow them and care for them as well. I hope that that has given you a fun weekend project or inspired you to bring some water and um, the sound, the, the feeling of water into your garden um, or to your tabletop or to your workspace, whether um, it be that scale uh, of the smaller water gardens for your table or the full uh, barrel of water garden plants on your patio or balcony. And uh, as always, thank you for tuning in. Uh, happy gardening.